Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, thanks also for the nice introduction. Uh, I think you covered most of it. My name is Dominic Escoffier. Um, my first virtual reality experience was in 2012 when a 20-year-old guy from uh, Silicon Valley, uh, sorry, from Los Angeles, built a virtual reality headset in his garage. And back then it was literally a, a, a screen ripped out from a smartphone uh, some sensors glued on top of it, two lenses, and then all of that duct taped to a pair of ski goggles. And that was my first virtual reality experience, and it was mind-blowing. Even then, um, playing John Carmack's unreleased Do Doom 3 demo was something that really put me onto my path in virtual reality. So one of the things that I wanted to do is I wanted to get more virtual reality content. I wanted to uh, fight against Dr. Breen in Half-Life in virtual reality. I wanted to be on a spaceship in virtual reality. I wanted to travel the world virtually from the comfort of my home. I wanted people to train better, to learn better, to just have virtual reality as, a, as an all-encompassing, like a pervasive technology. And so within my limits, I did a couple of things on the side uh, to help VR at least become more of a thing than it was before. Um, so I helped start the Oculus community on Reddit, which is now one of the largest unofficial communities for uh, virtual reality on the internet. Um, I started a non-profit initiative called euvr.org together with other experts from the European Meetup um, community to help drive forward the, um, the industry in Europe. And um, my background is actually in games. So I worked at Rockstar Games and I quit that job in 2015. Uh, to start my own virtual reality company, uh, also together with two other experts called Realities.io. It's, it's an app, it's really cool, it's free on Steam, um, that allows you to take real places scanned with photogrammetry or LiDAR scans and then visit them in virtual reality. And we brought that um, startup through an accelerator program in Silicon Valley um, in uh, early 2016. And to wrap this up, when I came back from the United States, uh, NVIDIA offered me the role as their head of virtual reality for the EMEA e region, which means Europe, Middle East, Africa, and India. And I'm going to be talking today about NVIDIA's role in the AR VR ecosystem. So what, what, what do we believe in? Why is NVIDIA so heavily invested into virtual reality? And the answer for that is the holodeck. Many of us are dreaming of this concept of the holodeck that was first introduced in 1974 in the animated series for, um, for Star Trek, obviously. So how many of you have seen uh, the holodeck in Star Trek in any, in any shape or form? Well, it's actually not so many. So what the, what the holodeck does is it essentially simulates a, an alt alternate reality. In the holodeck, you can do anything you want. You can be on Mars, you can have uh, ladies dancing around you, you can be in a casino underground. Anything that you can imagine is possible in the holodeck because the holodeck simulates the real world in a very, very convincing way. So what has to happen for this simulation to be super convincing, it has to act right, it has to look right, it has to sound right, and it has to feel right because those are the things that our brain for, for tens of thousands of years is trained to, to distinguish reality from something that is a little bit weird. So for example, if we've eaten any bad sh mushrooms or something like that, and our sense of reality is distorted, your brain immediately loses the sense of presence within the scene. And this is something that's also hugely important in virtual reality. You want to simulate every single sense in a way that is very um, convincing to the user. So the question that we have at, at NVIDIA is, can the holodeck really become a reality? So obviously, NVIDIA is a company that's driven by the hunt for photorealistic graphics. So the, the part where the worlds look right is the one that, that we think is, is, is the where we are driving the most innovation. But we're driving a lot of innovation in other, in other parts of this whole um, ecosystem, and I'm going to go into that a little bit later. Let me jump a, a little bit back here. So in 1974, when the concept of the holodeck was born, around that time, uh, Ivan Sutherland also um, invented his first virtual reality or mixed reality headset. And in this little video, you can see why this thing is called the Sword of Damocles. It, it, the reason for that is because it's held up by a wire system because it's so heavy that it's literally hovering above your head. And what it does is it paints a cube within 
the uh, within your reality. So it's a very very basic and 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 very um, proof of concept way of showing that virtual reality or augmented reality can actually work. But obviously the resolution and the, the ergonomics and everything about this device was just so wrong on so many levels. It was not a consumer device at all. And if you look at the content side in the 70s, how, how many of you have recognized this little guy? It's Indiana Jones rendered in 28 pixels on the Atari 2600. Um, this gives you a little bit of an overview of how the content side was like in the, in the 70s. So both on the hardware side and on the content side, we were far from any immersive experiences. Let's jump forward to the early 90s. The headsets actually became much, much better, but they were still shit. So what they did was uh, they had very low resolution, really bad tracking, high latency, but it was, it was getting closer and closer. Just like the content side was getting closer and closer to this, to this, this, this fascination with photorealism. Obviously, this is not photorealism. This is Doom, this is Doom um, in played in the 90s. But it was the early start for 3D rendered worlds, essentially. Now take a step into, into, into modern times. Today, we actually have the ability to render scenes completely photorealistic. The, the it's, it, there's, a, there's a game out there um, that essentially, it's a, or it's a website that essentially shows you r renders and photos. And your, 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 your um, role is to distinguish the photos from the, from the renders. And it's really, really hard. So we're getting, we're getting really close to, to photorealism. You can see that here in a screenshot from Paragon, which is running on Unreal, uh, on Unreal Engine 4, and it allows you to render millions of polygons, shaders, skin, um, skin uh, su uh, subsurface scattering for uh, good, sh good skin reflections. All of these things are possible today with the rendering tools that we have at hand. And speaking of which, this is today's simulation engine. So the people that were rendering stuff in the, in the 70s and in the 90s, they needed supercomputers. This, this here um, is our Titan V, which is the, the flagship that we have right now. And in, in terms of pure computing power, it has 110 teraflops of processing power. And just to put that into perspective, the first PC, or the first supercomputer, sorry, that broke the one teraflop barrier was the ASCII Red in the late 90s. And the ASCII Red took about a room of, yeah, about a room of this size that was completely filled just with, um, co with electro electrical components. And all of that, 100 times as much performance, you get 20 years later in a form factor like this. And this all is ob obviously is supposed to show you that we're making huge leaps. We are making huge leaps on both the content, the hardware, and, th and the application side. And I tapped into this earlier. The, the holodeck, if, you, if we really want a holodeck that is totally believable, the first thing that it needs to nail 100% is the visuals. So you really want a virtual simulation that reacts just like the real world, or looks just like the real world. And uh, as, a, as a little bit of an example, um, I brought here our latest tech demo from GDC. This is um, called Reflections, and it's a real-time ray tracing demo. So ray tracing, for those of you who aren't aware, is a very computationally expensive um, procedure or uh, calculation that you need to make. Essentially, you're shooting rays through the room, you follow those rays, and then each individual photon gets reflected back to the camera, and, and this way you essentially reconstruct the whole scene. And in this one, you might think, well, it's just a scene from Star Wars, right? No, this is running on real time, in real time with ray tracing. So every single reflection you see on the, on the covers of, these, of, of the stormtroopers, anything you saw in here, every little, every little light detail was physically correctly simulated, which is obviously very important for a believable experience. So for example, if you're in a virtual reality experience, there's a shiny, a shiny floor and the, the reflections just look weird, you know, just look a little bit off, your brain will immediately tell you that something's, something's wrong here and you will lose this, this fragile sense of presence that is very, very important for virtual reality. But virtual worlds also have to be physically correctly simulated. So what we mean with this is, I'm just gonna let this run in the background, um, is, our, is our GameWorks SDK. So we have been building for years and years and years, not par in particular for VR, but it's very useful in VR, a system that allows you to physically 
simulate objects, fire, smoke, fluids, um, cloth, anything, anything that has physical um, parameters that needs to behave correctly. And in this case, this is a scene that runs in real time, 90 frames per second on a Titan V, and put, um, put a little bit of focus on how the fire and the smoke even interacts with geometry in the room. So if you have a spreading wildfire, it will, it will behave like you would, you would expect it from the real world, and your, again, your sense of immersion will be much, much stronger. Because if something behaves wrong, so for example, if you splash a bucket of water in VR, and it does all kinds of weird things, you're immediately going to lose this sense, of, this sense of presence because something's wrong. Your brain is very much trained to seeing if things are wrong. Virtual worlds also have to feel right, though. So how do, you, how do you, if you grab an object in VR, how do you make it happen that it actually feels like an object? Or if you have a spider walking across your, across your hand, how do you make that? How, how, do you, how do you get that impression into the user's hands? And uh, we're actually working with different haptics providers. One of them is actually called Haptics. Um, and they are building gloves that are, that are, they are huge. It's, like, uh, it's, it's, it's so big, it's far away from a consumer product. But what it does is really amazing. So it has pressure chambers within the hand that allow you to individually have fine, the fine legs of a spider or raindrops falling on your head. And they can even simulate things like heat and cold. So, for example, you have two faucets, and the one is hot water, the other one is cold water. You'll actually feel the difference between those two. That will help drive more immersion in virtual worlds. And those guys are actually thinking ahead and are building something that could also be in Ready Player One. Ah, by the way, how many of you have seen Ready Player One in the cinema? Okay, so it's semi-popular. <laughs> Um, Ready Player One is a, is a movie about the future of virtual reality. It's essentially there's a world called the Oasis um, where everybody logs into. It's the world where you have your friends, where you go to school, where you have access to the best teachers in the world. And it's a, it's a, it's a place where you can also buy high-end equipment like this little, this little thing here. It's a full-body exoskeleton suit, so to speak. So this will allow you in the future, it's not a product yet, but they are working on it, um, will allow you in the future to actually have full body immersion in virtual worlds, which is obviously something that not many people will put in their homes, but I think a lot of people will have something like that in cinemas or family entertainment centers, in theme parks, and so on and so forth. So virtual worlds have to feel right, but they also have to sound right. A lot of people are forgetting this in, in, in virtual reality. Um, the, the way that we've, been, that we've been doing things for games doesn't really work anymore for virtual reality. So what we did in games was, um, or what's still being done, is called positional, direct positional audio. Essentially, you take the sound source over here, you take the, the user over there, and then you send one sound, one, one sound path, and that's it. But that's not how the real world works. In the real world, sound waves behave completely different. Sound waves refract off of objects. They get occluded by pillars. They, they bounce off of geometry. They get... Um, they get um, uh, absorbed by things like cloth, for example. And so what you have to do instead to, to, to have a proper audio experience as well is simulate the audio in a much more sophisticated way. And what we're doing is actually, is actually coming from our own initiative into ray tracing. So we've taken our, um, our algorithm that does ray tracing, which is called the optics uh, engine that we use specifically for ray tracing, and we've rewritten that for audio. So essentially what we do is we send a lot of rays across the room. Some of these rays are getting blocked and, and never even reach the user. And that way you have a much, much more immersive and realistic experience in VR. Because as the sound source he over here moves around you, you'll actually have the exact feeling. You, you, you don't even need to look. You'll hear where it's coming from, which is obviously very important. So if you, if you are in a virtual reality experience and there's a, there's a tank rolling up next to you, you obviously want to hear that tank from the right from the right angle, right? Or if you're in a in a in a horror game like Resident Evil 7, you really want to hear those noises coming from the right from the right spot. Otherwise, they might be able to jump scare you. And also, virtual worlds have to act right. One of the things that that is leveraging NVIDIA GPUs is called IBM Watson. It's a speech to text recognition tool that we've helped um, uh, Ubisoft 
to implement into their game called Star Trek Bridge Crew. So Star Trek Bridge Crew is a super cool game. If, if you haven't played it yet, grab a couple of friends, play it. It's it's really really hilarious in, with with friends. But if you don't have if you don't have any friends online, or um, you need just or one of them is skipping out because his baby's crying or anything. Um, you now have the chance in, in Star Trek Bridge Crew to replace one of those team members by an AI member. And the AI member, you can either click on menus to, to tell him what to do, or you can use Watson's speech to text recognition to just naturally talk to them, and then they will follow your orders according to what they've, according to what they've heard. Um, which is obviously a much, much better way in an in a, in a, in a, uh, intense fight with the Klingons. You don't want to like look around in menus, you just want to shout orders and, and hopefully the AI does, um, does what you want it to do. So this is, this is essentially what's very important in VR is that you have worlds that look right, act right, are physically simulated and that sound right. And uh, what we're doing is um, we're, we're wrapping all of this into our own SDK called the VRWorks SDK. So it, it takes care of performance enhancements on the, on the graphics side. Um, it simulates audio in a very, very believable way. It allows you to do physics and touch. So how do you interact with virtual objects? And it also allows you to capture things. I haven't touched on this uh, a lot, but it also but just um, for the sake of um, um, comprehensiveness. Uh, it also does capture. So if you have a 360 camera, up to eight cameras in stereo, can be real-time live stitched on a GPU, which is great for anybody who's doing production shots because they don't have to go to the shot, take the, take the footage, go back to the studio, stitch it, look at it, realize, oh shit, we should have put the actor not over here, but over there. They can do all of that in real time, directly on the shoot with our VRWorks 360 SDK. But we're also doing applications. And I've started this, this little talk about the holodeck, the, our journey to holodeck. And we are so keen on making that happen that we've actually built it. So Holodeck is our internal, um, essentially a sandbox to push virtual reality um, in, a, in, 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 in ways that aren't possible with other applications. So one of them, um, one of the applications that we've, that we've put a lot of focus on is essentially uh, product design. So in modern times, uh, products are often designed in CAD models. They are go up to millions of polygons. They are very complicated, elaborate designs. And to view those in virtual reality is almost important just because of the number of the, uh, of the polys that you have to show at the same time. So how do you solve that? How do you get photorealistic visuals um, in, into an app like Holodeck? I'm going to show you in just a second. But we w what we also want to do is product design is a very collab collaborative thing. So if you're, for example, designing a, a um, $100,000 sports car, super sports car, you want to make sure that you have the, the uh, deciders from all over the globe in a meeting to look at this, at this product that you're designing. So you could have an engineer from San Francisco, a designer from Tokyo, both sharing a virtual space without having to go on a plane and then talk about the model that will be in front of them in real size. And the last thing is um, believable, believable uh, physics. So if you're, again, if you're designing something like a $100,000 sports car and you want to grab the steering wheel, you don't, you don't want your hands to just clip through, like, what is this? You want your, you want your hands to actually react um, to, the, to the geometry in the room. And what this looks like is probably best shown in a video. So what you see here is uh, a Koenigsegg super sports car. It has about 50 million polygons and about 20,000 individual parts. And what you can do in Holodeck now is you can essentially do engineering reviews. You can take apart the car, you can take away the door, um, you can even do things like measuring and, 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 um, and painting onto the, onto the car uh, itself. You can make annotations to your colleagues. And then you can do even crazy things because this is obviously, this is VR, so you can do things that would never be possible in any other product um, design workflow. So one thing you can do is you can just grab this little clipping plane and look into the motor. So you have the chance to actually clip through each individual part. And then when you want to go really crazy, you just let the whole car explode. And again, this is, this is now, this what you see here is being rendered 90 frames per second for virtual reality, so in stereo, and with 20,000 parts and up to 120 million polygons is what we've, what we've managed um, to put through uh, Holodeck. 
And then obviously when the engineering review is done, design reviews are also important. So you want to look at your car in different environments, you want to give it different colors, uh, you want to see what it looks like in a factory hall or in the dealership. You can do all of that in virtual reality just, just, just by the press of a button, just with the press of a button. And you can even see what it looks like at night or in the Aurora Borealis if you want to. So this is, this is Holodeck. This is our, our collaborative design tool uh, for product design of the future. So just to, just to recap this a little bit, we are doing obviously the hardware. We are the hardware manufacturer for virtual reality. Uh, we do SDKs, so both the GameWorks SDK for physically correct simulation as well as the VRWorks SDK that gives you more performance if you're a v v virtual reality developer. And then on top of that also applications because we want to show what's possible in modern VR experiences. But we are just getting started. Because we want to drive virtual reality at the limits of human perception. And this is a very, very tricky thing to do because like I said in the, in the beginning of this talk, the brain is a very fine-tuned machine. It knows exactly and it, it can see very clearly fi even fine details. So you can't, really, you can't really trick your brain too much. You just have to push it to the limits of the human perception. Your VR headset has to drive photons at the limits of human perception. What does that look like? Your, your average field of view is about 220 degrees uh, um, uh, vertical. Horizontal, I always mix those up those two, horizontal, and about 135 degree vertical. The resolution that your eye is able to distinguish within the in the center of your of your vision, which is called the phobia, is about 120 pixels per, per degree. So if you just take only that, you're already looking at about 400 million pixels, which is about 200 times the equivalent of a full HD TV, which means that if you want to drive just this, you would have to render 200 full HD displays, which is obviously a lot of pixels that you have to push. But add, add up to that, that you want to drive future VR experiences at 240 frames per second, so that it's very comfortable and, and very good for your eyes, no eye strain at all. And you also want to do this um, at, a, at, a, at, a, uh, sorry, at a bandwidth that, is, that results in about 100,000 megapixels per second. Right now, modern VR system like an HTC Vive has to render about 450 megapixels per second. So you're looking at about seven to eight times by that alone. Uh, sorry, by ab <laughs> sorry, about uh, 100,000 times to 1 million times beyond what the modern VR system does. Because you also have to do things like high dynamic range, photorealistic lighting like ray tracing. All of these things are computationally very, very expensive. And what I'm trying to say here is that if we want to drive future VR systems at the limits of human perception, but we need about a million times as much processing power, it will take a little while until that happens. So we have to find clever engineering tools to actually circumvent or alleviate this problem. And one of those clever engineering tools is, um, is called foveated rendering. So like I, said, uh, like I said just a minute ago, the, the center of your vision is able to... Um, to see in very high resolution. This part is called the phobia. Everything beyond that, the whole periphery of your vision is actually super blurry and super low res. So what you can do is you can use this to your advantage by only driving, by only um, rendering the parts where the user is actually looking at, at high resolution. So only the phobia gets the full resolution and the rest of the image gets lower resolution. And this way you essentially save pixels that you can't see anyway because they're in the outer parts of your vision. What you have to have for something like that to work is obviously a device that tells you exactly where on the screen you are looking at at any given moment, which is a, t a, a, a system called eye tracking. So there's a system, little cameras within the headset, track your eyes, see exactly, okay, he's now, he's looking at the, now he's looking at the clock, we better render the clock at full resolution. And then other things that, you, that, that are very important are... Um, uh, things that alleviate the virgin's accommodation um, effect. So bear with me here, it's a little bit, little bit complicated, but not so much. So usually what your eyes do to perceive depth is they converge, so they do this, but then they also focus. 
So for example, if I look all the way in the distance, my eyes will be mostly parallel and my focus layer is somewhere over there. If I put my if I if I look at something that's very close to my eyes, my eyes will converge. But also the focus layer of my of my of my iris will, will get closer. So th those two things are intertwined. They are very much connected in in real reality, so to speak. With current virtual reality headsets, you have the problem that this that your eyes can converge, but they will always focus on the same on the same plane. That's Partly the reason for that is optics. And so this virgins accommodation conflict is only there if you look at, at current VR devices. And it's m most people don't even realize that there's a, that there's a conflict, but it, it leads to eye strain and it also leads to uh, uh, motion sickness with some people. So you really want to get rid of that problem as well. Long story short, one way to solve this problem is called um, very focal optics. So essentially, it's an, op it's, it's an optics device that allows you to focus on different planes as you are also converging onto different planes. And one of those uh, computational displays we've built in our research and development uh, team, and just to make sure, all of these are, it's just research and development. It non none, of the none of this is, is bound to, be, uh, to become a product anytime soon. So please don't go out and, and, and try to buy the NVIDIA Super Slim glasses. Um, because what you see here is a very slim version of a virtual reality headset. Um, but in this case, it's also very, very, very low resolution. So, oh, what the hell? Oh. Give me a second. We'll be right back after this short advertisement break. Do we? Yes. Um, so this device is actually, this allows you actually to focus onto different planes, but it's very, very low resolution because right now it's just research and development. But what this does is it essentially renders, it renders a lot of different viewports and then those viewports get then viewed in the lens uh, through something, uh, sorry, to the viewer in something called a micro lens array, which combines all of these, all of these smaller images into one image that's then perceived. But again, these are things that are very much in the realm of research and development and future technologies. But I want to leave this question open. Is, the real, is a real holodeck close to reality? I, I mean, I've talked a little bit about the leaps that we've made on the content, on the hardware side. But the next, the next 15 years will probably be pretty crazy when it comes to virtual reality technology. And just for you to extrapolate this a little bit, if you look on the content side, 15 years ago, a car in GTA 3 was rendered with 10,000, 10, tens of thousands of polygons. Today, in, ho in NVIDIA Holodeck, we can render uh, cars with up to 50 million polygons. Just for you to extrapolate, can a Holodeck really become a reality? If you ask me, I'm pretty sure it will. I mean, we have a lot of time in front of us and there's a lot of things that are still to be discovered and to, for VR to become this really unique, convincing, very, very immersive experience. Thank you very much.